Merci, Diana. Merci, Karen. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much. Um, you know, I wish like, we could bring up that picture that you actually had because the first thing that I would say is that shadow in the background with the big guy. I'm so divergent that it's definitely not me. Uh, and so I don't know who chose that image, but uh, it's wonderful. I'm very grateful to be here, and I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna lie to you. I'll keep my jazz heads down because I'm. I'm a little nervous, um, and I'm sweaty. And part of the reason for that, you'll understand as we go through. But my performer mask is very much on, and I'm very much um, interested in um, putting on a show for this powerful community here in Montreal, which I'm so grateful to be presenting to. And in fact, I know that there are people that are not in Montreal uh, as well. And, you know, when I was thinking about Divergent um, and like Diana, I looked up the definition and I didn't like it uh, either. Um, and I think some of the time when we think of Divergent, we just need to think about um, what isn't working in the world that we might need to rethink and that we can pursue a way to go after in this case, reclaiming it. And so I, I wanted to talk to you today about reclaiming masculinity as a way of divergence because um, I think as the subtitle for my talk says, it's not toxic. Masculinity inherently is not toxic, but it is suffocating and it's suffocating men. And this is something that has really come through for me over the past three years. And as you'll, you know, as I'll share with you today, um, it's something that has been building up over time through the socialization of myself. And I'm gonna speak very much from the I, from my own personal experience. Um, but it's important to note that in the three plus years that I've been, I've been working on this, that um, I've spoken with literally thousands of men and I know today that I'm not alone. Um, as well as doing humanity, which I should say is a, uh, a volunteer project. Um, I'm also very honored and I would be negligent to, to neglect that I, I work for the United Nations, for the High Commission of Refugees, um, and you know, the mental well-being, the mental health of, of men and women who go through these things is also something that's very top of mind as well. So um, yeah, I just wanted to bring that through. So what will you need for today? Well, the first thing you're gonna need actually um, is openness. Uh, openness to, to this idea that despite everything we're seeing in the news and despite everything that we're um, reading about sort of the negative influences that men have had on society, um, that patriarchy is in fact something that doesn't only affect women. It obviously is the most overt and the most obvious uh, community that gets impacted by patriarchy, but that men as well are negatively impacted by patriarchy. Curiosity, that to me is just something that we should be bringing into all of our conversations. And at some point, I'm gonna ask you to have a little bit of courage and to be a little bit vulnerable yourselves. And in order to do that, you're gonna need some pen and paper. So if you don't have anything handy right away, I'll ask you to, to do that while we, while we get the talk going. So I'm gonna invite you today basically to come and walk with me. Um, as I share with you a little bit about my experience and my um, my struggles and my successes with my own sense of self, my mental well-being, and the impacts that that's had on me and on the people that I care about. Basically, whether we realize it or not, we spend our whole life wearing masks. And that is really what I'm going to be speaking to a lot today. Um, most of the time, we don't even realize that we're wearing masks, but we are. And the only question is whether or not we're able to shift from an unintentional wearing of masks to an intentional one, where we know how we're showing up, where we're present to who we are in any given moment. And that completely shifts the power dynamic that we have in relationship to the mask. And I would argue that for most of them, actually, I don't have to argue, it was my experience that for most of my life, I was wearing masks without realizing that I was wearing them. All right. So what masks shall I wear? Well, I believe that, you know, the masks that we choose to wear are largely influenced by a baseline narrative 
that we have about ourselves. We have an underlying belief about who we are and what we bring through to the world. And I know that that was how, no matter what mask I put on, that was the lens through which I was experiencing that mask. And for me, I've come to realize that my most baseline narrative is that I am small. And this started very early in my life. I was physically small. I'm still not a big guy today. Um, I was happy to have a growth spurt upon graduating uh, high school. Um, however, that narrative of I am small translated from a physical um, demonstration to something where it was expressing itself in what I thought my value was to the world um, as it became more and more ingrained with me. And again, for the most part, I, I had no idea that this was the narrative that I was directing my life with. So some of my masks started very young. Um, my family is a religious family and um, being a good Christian was definitely something that um, I was encouraged to be. And so that was a mask that I was, I was wearing from a very young age. Um, I was very active. I love sports, hockey, soccer, tennis, baseball. Um, and so being a good athlete was another mask that I was wearing when I was young. Later on in life, I, I wanted to be a meditator. I, I thought that this was um, something that would be very beneficial. And so this idea of being a good meditator or being someone who meditated uh, was another mask that I put on. Um, my early career was in sales, and so being the superstar salesman that had all the best numbers and so on and so forth um, was also very important to me. And then later on in life, I, I became an entrepreneur when I started my own business, and so this was yet another mask that I was putting on. The problem became when those masks started to shatter because I wasn't living through them intentionally. And so I started to ask questions of the church when I was a, a teenager. And my questions went largely unanswered. And the more I asked them, um, the more I got pushback against my curiosity about my, my inquisitiveness uh, to the point where it was clear that the more questions I asked, I was actually demonstrating not being a good Christian. And so I made the decision at around 14 years old that I would leave the church. And this having gone through a period where I thought I wanted to be a priest, I was an altar boy, we were at the church three, four times a week. Um, and, and so this mass shattered uh, and, and I was no longer worthy of being in the church. Uh, my athletic skills never uh, equaled my ambition. Uh, I was for, I'm dating myself as well by putting a picture up here of Wayne Gretzky probably the greatest player of all time. Uh, and not only was I um, not as good skillfully as, as he was, um, he, you know, I was not big enough. I was not strong enough. I was getting cut from teams when physical contact came into play because I wasn't able to hold my space. And so I actually started to move around sports. I never stopped playing sports, but I started to play around with sports because I was trying to find something that I was, I was good at. Um, after about six months of meditation, the first time around, uh, I realized that I was I was I wasn't floating. And the pictures of the monks who were, you know, they had this beautiful look. Their minds were, you know, all at peace, and they were able to do these amazing things. And for me, my mind was just continually going faster and faster. And so I stopped meditating, you know, after six months because I was failing at this, um, and and I felt like I just wasn't good enough for it. Um, when my sales were not bringing me the big numbers as, as any of these gentlemen would and my level of entrepreneurship as a young Steve Jobs was also not uh, successful, I took that on as me not being worthy of being successful at these positions uh, and in these roles. And so everything that I was experiencing because I had that baseline narrative of being small was reinforcing this idea that this is exactly how it's supposed to be because I am so small. The most important roles are the ones where we should definitely not be wearing masks, where our authentic selves need to come through. And, and you know, first um, I got in mid six and um, 
you know, without a strong self, that was going to be a challenge because I'd always put myself through these lenses. And while I got married, my wife had two children from her previous marriage. So he's also an instant father. And so these masks and this underlying narrative of I am small, still being very present, be still not having tapped into it and bringing this into those two most important roles that I think any man can be asked to be, which is a husband and a father, um, was, was something that down the road was unfortunately um, going to come back to haunt me. Society told me, tells us that, you know, a good father, a good husband, you know, he brings home the bacon, uh, you put a roof over their head, that's your job. Um, you got to be a man, you got to be strong, right? Go out, go drink with the boys. These are the things that dads do. We're supposed to go out and be with the boys. Um, I'm supposed to work 80 plus hours. And I wore that like a badge of honor, right? I mean, it was almost a competition sometimes when I was gathering with my friends, either going for those drinks or playing hockey with them. You know, who was working the most hours? How are you doing? I'm busy. Oh yeah, I did 80 hours this week. I did 90 hours this week. It was a competition that we were putting on for each other. We're supposed to watch a lot of sports. Apparently that's, that's what we do. You know, hockey games every night, watching it on on the television or going to the bars or whatnot. These are the narratives that I was, I was told and emotions are not to be demonstrated. So we are not supposed to be, uh, you know, in touch with our emotions. Um, unless of course it is, is anger or the fleeting emotion of, of joy or happiness, but, but even though we have to be careful because we don't want to seem like we're showing off or being cocky. Um, and these were very much things that, that I was experiencing. And the biggest narrative of all was that, you know, if the people that I love don't appreciate me for what I'm doing and they can't see how awesome I am, then the problem is theirs. And really that's nothing that I had to be concerned of. I just needed to keep doing it until they finally saw it. Right. And, and, and so that's exactly what I did. I went from 60 hours to 70 hours to 80 hours, making more and more money, bringing more and more home. And what I was really doing was creating this distance. This is of course not me, nor is it my, my wife and daughter, um, but it was creating this distance. I was building this wall between my family, the people that I cared about most and myself by trying to be a father and husband through the social constructs that had been put forth that we see in our marketing and in our advertising and all these different things. And then in 2017, it all came crashing down. I saw myself as a protector and as a provider. And I walked into the office one day and I was told that I was losing my job. And everything that I was bringing to the table, all the value that I was bringing into my home was literally ripped out from underneath me. Um, but here I am, I'm not supposed to show emotions. I'm, I'm supposed to be the strong one. I'm supposed to be there for my wife and my kids. And my relationship with my friends are not based on these kinds of situations. They're not based with helping us to navigate these moments. And so, I actually, my last day was on a Friday. I woke up on a Monday and I went to work. And what that meant was, is that I, I brought a laptop downtown and I went to coffee shops and libraries and other public spaces, going through the motions of going to work, trying desperately to come up with a plan to regain my position within my home. Nobody knew exactly what I was going through. And it was extremely rough, you know, rough and frustrating. And the, the pressure just kept building and building. As I was going through this, I didn't even, you know, I was in such a position where I didn't even actually tell my wife for three weeks that I had lost my job because of the shame and the guilt and the judgment of what that would potentially mean for who I was and what I brought. If I didn't have these things, what was I to the family? What good was I because of the distance that I had created? And the fallout, of course, um, and I'm going to give some general numbers here, but, you know, this is an experience that so many men go through. And when we understand th how these experiences produce themselves and, and express themselves out in society, men are responsible for 97% of mass shootings. And there's another percent and a half that you could add on to that because those are joint with a woman involved. 
88% of reported domestic abuse is committed by men. Addiction, alcohol, drug abuse, pornography, these are all skyrocketing. These are all ways that men suppress and avoid dealing with what it is that they're going through in their lives. Men are four times more likely to die by suicide. In the time that we're going to be here together today, 72 men. Sorry. Well, I've died by suicide. That's 72 too many. And they don't have to. And this part gets me because I've been there. We're more likely to lone wolf it when we're struggling. We don't tell people what we're going through because we're afraid of what people will think. We're, more, we're less likely to speak up and to seek professional help. We don't want anyone to tell us that we're broken. We don't want anyone to tell us that we need help. Gen X men, of which I am one, are the category of men with the fewest friends. In fact, are the category of person with the fewest friends on an average of less than two. And nearly 60% of all men have suicidal thoughts. They ideate, they go through the ideas and the thoughts of how they will die. They believe that their families and their loved ones will be better off if they're not with them. <sighs> so hard to believe that that's gonna be the lead in for a breakup session, but it is. I'd like you to think about what is something about yourself that you gladly show to the world when you leave your home, when you go out in public, when you post something on Facebook or Instagram or wherever it is. An example for me is that I'm confident. I don't want the, peop the world to know that I'm not confident. So I display, I, I show up in ways that are very confident appearing. And then on the back, what is something about yourself that you hide from the world when you leave your home that you don't want them to see? And again, to give you an idea of one that is still very much alive for me is the idea of being a people pleaser and an approval seeker. So I have a really hard time saying no to people. Um, when somebody asks something of me, you know, I'll, I'll put my hand up even though I have no bandwidth, even though, you know, there's, there's really, you know, I might not even be the best person for it at the time for whatever reasons, but I don't like to say no to people because I'm constantly seeking that approval. Um, and five years ago, there's no way that I could have admitted that to a, a room with people I don't know and some who I do, but I just could never have admitted it. Um, so take a moment to think about that. So the experience we just went through was very high level. I saw comments in the chat, you know, about how there wasn't enough time and, and, and so on and so forth. And that's so inspiring to see. And we're going to leave some time, and I would love to get feedback at the end. Uh, I just have a couple of more things I wanted to share. But, you know, one of the most inspiring things that I've come to realize during this, this work that I'm doing, which, again, is, is, you know, my volunteer work, but is that there is a movement, there's a new paradigm that is being created by men, for men, and most often supported by women, which is the most important element because we're so afraid of it being hidden and, and, and not being able to bring it out. You know, there's organizations, I put some up here, um, Sacred Sons and Every Man, Man Talks, uh, Uncivilized, uh, Unshakable Man, and, and of course, you know, Humanity, which is um, the, the organization that I founded. And what's really important, I think, in this time is that we start to also navigate not only a new paradigm of how we show up, but a new language. And so, you know, talking about things like instead of, you know, man up or did you win and stop whining, you know, let's start with what can you learn? How did it go? And what are you feeling as a way to engage young boys as a first place, but then also adults as they grow older? There's a saying by Francis Weller, and I don't agree with the exact wording that he uses, but it's, um, 
it's easier to raise a strong boy than it is to fix a broken man. And the, re the only reason why I have any issue with that is because I don't believe that any man is broken. I don't believe that any person is broken. They're doing the best they can with the tools that they have. Um, but it's very powerful, the opportunity to, to work with boys and, and young men to help them develop the skills and the, the social constructs that serve them. And it would be automatic that as we go through these, that new norms come up where it's perfectly natural to see two friends hugging in the street as if it was nothing. We're blessed in Montreal that this is relatively acceptable pre-COVID anyways. And I personally hope we'll get back to that again when this is, is behind us. Um, where men don't feel embarrassed and shamed to cry in public and be supported by another man through whatever it is that they're going through. Men taking on non-traditional roles as nurses. You know, the picture might look like they're doctors, but they're not, they're nurses. And, and we need more men. We have a shortage of nurses that are coming. We're gonna require men to step into that. And hey, women in the room, who wouldn't like to see more of this? Come on, <laughs> right? But for it to be okay, and more importantly, for the man to find joy in doing it, to be happy to be doing it. So one of my favorite quotes, and this is what's so important, and, and you've just experienced a little bit of it, but, you know, a badass Navy SEAL who I really, you know, appreciate a lot is, there can be no courage unless we are first vulnerable by Jocko Willink. And just in case you're wondering whether or not he's a badass, that's a picture of him, right? Um, but it's so true. You know, we don't, we don't give members in the military medals for doing brave things in non-dangerous situations. And if you're in a dangerous situation, you are vulnerable. And that's when courage is required. And it's the same with our emotions. It's the same with what we're feeling and what we're navigating in our day-to-day -day lives. And so I encourage all of us to be more vulnerable, to demonstrate more courage, and to support others to do that as well. Thank you so much for your time. I'm open to questions and comments, and I would really love to take a bit of time to get some feedback.